the people we're talking about, these pioneer Jews, were almost entirely, there were a few exceptions, German Jews, who came to New Mexico beginning in the 1850s, 40, late 40s and 50s. We defined pioneer families, roughly those who came from the mid 19th century to roughly World War One. We overlapped a bit into the early 20s. You know, there's five or six different turning points in New Mexico history. And uh, two of them definitely are the introduction of the Santa Fe Trail, and then of course the introduction of the, the, the railroad. Santa Fe Trail starting in 1821 and the railroad coming by 1880. Uh, and it's very interesting how the, the Jews became involved in the, the, the trade on the Santa Fe Trail by the 1840s at least, and uh, that was a, a real impetus to their, their business activities, their, their, their growth of their importance here in New Mexico. But it was nothing compared to the, co the coming of the railroad. It's just amazing, on, on the whole territory of course, but in, including by these people who, who really took the, the lead in, in so many of these these areas. As Douglas said, uh, they brought certain towns, uh, they filled certain niches, they uh, were innovative in ways that other people hadn't been, hadn't thought of uh, been, uh, been, because they ha didn't have that same experience here of being in Europe and, and, uh, and working with that capitalist economy and uh, maybe sometimes back east. Uh, they were bringing these new ideas, these new techniques. The first definite Jew was uh, Solomon Jacob Spiegelberg came to New Mexico. It's some confusion, either 46, 47, or possibly as late as 48. He had many ties to the army. In fact, many of the New Mexico Jewish uh, merchants in the first 30 years or so uh, made uh, their careers and profits by supplying the U.S. Army. These contracts were invaluable because they provided cash. Now, Uncle Sam might be slow in paying the bills, but he did pay the bills. And it was the, almost the only supply of cash in New Mexico territory at the time. And that gave a lot of the merchants capital to carry on their general mercantile interests. Because otherwise, it was a barter economy and uh, because the Anglo settlers and the Hispanos who were here uh, didn't see much cash. You saw cash once or twice a year when you sold your crop. As pioneers, and you've mentioned this often, uh, they were great risk takers, uh, going into various businesses, uh, starting in one and branching out into uh, others as new opportunities arose and uh, as other opportunities closed up. Uh, capitalists are only successful if they can adopt to the situation at the time. And, and the Jews were excellent at it uh, in, in terms of uh, the mercantile business and into the banking industry and then to real estate and ranching and mining. Uh, it, it just goes on and on. You could say that they were a catalyst to capitalism in, in New Mexico. One thing about Jews throughout history is they learn to speak other languages. Uh, because they were often on the move. And it was not uncommon for Jews in Europe, throughout Europe, to be fluent in three, four languages. Uh, and often that was passed on to kids, children and so forth. And so they were successful here because they learned Spanish. A number of the recent arrivals uh, learned Spanish before they learned English, in fact. Uh, and uh, because you've got to speak to your customers. So, you want to add to that? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think of the uh, Jews in New Mexico as cultural brokers in many cases. Uh, cultural brokers are, are people who belong to one culture but get along really well with other cultures. Uh, and are able to deal with both cultures to the benefit of each. The people of Las Vegas said that they were, uh, they were Hispanics and they were Anglos, and then that there was this doctor, this <laughs> Jewish doctor. And it wasn't that he was, they were excluded from either one, it was because they were cultural brokers. They could deal with both of them mm -hmm. and be admired by both of them, because both groups trusted them and knew they could go there and, and be understood in, in, in Spanish or, 
whatever the language was, and, and, and get a good deal, be taken care of, and, and to his families. Uh, Archbishop Lamy, uh, getting along really well with the Jewish families there in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the priests in the local uh, parishes, like in Bernalillo. Right. Uh, and and the, the, the whole thing of calling Charles Ilfeld, Tio Carlos. Very interesting. It's uh, he'd be, uh, uh, well known in Las mm -hmm. Vegas and elsewhere right. by the Hispanics. Uh, B'nai B'rith, the children of the covenant, was an opportunity for Jews, and not just German Jews, but there were non-German Jews as well, to get together socially outside of the synagogue. It was the first, it was a great innovation because it, was, it didn't deal with religion at all. It was camaraderie, helping one another, like other fraternal organizations, they established life insurance, burial insurance, things of that sort. The Germans did that, other ethnic groups in New Mexico, many Jews would brave the elements, long distances, uh, to attend uh, meetings of, uh, of the neighborhood. Interestingly, Jews, when they come to New Mexico, are included among the Anglos. And they encounter relatively little discrimination. New Mexico, unlike our neighbors, Texas and Arizona has always been open. A Jewish involvement in, gen in civic affairs, you know, was common. Uh, they occupied a lot of the uh, lo local offices. Uh, Willie Spiegelberg was mayor of Santa Fe. Uh, they were on city council, county commissions, and so forth. Uh, One of the Ophels was the a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. That's right. 1910. Right. Now, Jews were fully involved in the political, social, uh, economic life of New Mexico. They rarely encountered the kind of anti-Semitism that they found in uh, elsewhere. There's no Jewish country club. Uh, Jews were, in fact, founders of the Albuquerque the Jewish, uh, the Albuquerque Country Club, uh, the first one, ex rather, you know, exclusive, still exists today. Uh, whereas in Arizona, in Phoenix, and Tucson, uh, there were, Jews were excluded from country clubs. In uh, Texas, they were excluded from country clubs. Uh, and so they formed their own. The later period, well, you have to look at the, those four Alsatian families that created downtown Albuquerque. A lot of the, you know, new firms came in. Uh, later on in the 1930s and 40s, like the Blaugrens coming in, establishing American furniture, Gordon Schwartz, sports and the like, uh, the Friedman family established a value house. They were uh, wholesalers for the most part. That, that uh, brings up the really important uh, point that's about serial migration. Uh, the families would come and bring their, bring their uh, uncles and cousins, and, uh, just everyone. And, and they'd come to places like El Paso and then branch out from there, or to, to Las Vegas and all these different places. Uh, I, I think there's more serial migration right. among Jewish families here in New Mexico than any other group. Oh, it's a very good point. And the book uh, brings that out. The essays uh, bring that out. So uh, the Spiegelbergs bring the Stobbs, they bring Amsberg and Ellsberg, who were related. Uh, they uh, are responsible for some others. Then there's, there's the whole network of the Wertheims, and the essays uh, bring that out. Uh, there were several branches of the Wertheim family, and uh, they're in Dona Anna, they're in Santa uh, Fort Sumner, <clears throat> they are in Tucumcari. Uh, they're all over. <laughs> and so this network uh, really helps to create a Jewish community in uh, New Mexico. And it was really interesting to see these 15 families, or more, and to see what they had in common and what they didn't have in common, and uh, uh, what sort of contributions they made. Uh, most people, for example, uh, think that 
uh, uh, Jews are all in, in, involved in business, business only. Well, it cl came clear in this book that that's not the case at all. Many were involved with as merchants, but others were ranchers, uh, some got in the tourist business, many in banking, uh, a diver great diversity. Uh, another myth is they were all in the cities, uh, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Las Vegas, and there were many there, but uh, there were many all over the state. And then uh, the, the last one is that uh, uh, it's assumed that uh, Jews are discriminated against everywhere. And there was some discrimination here in New Mexico, but not as much as other places. And uh, it was refreshing uh, to see that and to see how creative this group of people could be uh, without that, that, uh, that stigma, that, uh, that weight on them, and how, the, how much they could contribute to the, the state as a whole in these circumstances. Today, we, what was the estimate? About 20,000 uh, of New Mexico's 3.5 million people are Jews, but what a tremendous influence this, this small group uh, made, made on, on the, the whole territory and the state. And I, I think this, is, uh, this book helps to, to emphasize that. <laughs>